We're in 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 2, starting with verse 19. The word of God says, The people of the city said to Elisha, Look, our Lord, this town is well situated, as you can see, but the water is bad and the land is unproductive. Sounds like a lot of churches I know. Unproductive. Bring me, he says, a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring and threw the salt into it, saying, this is what the Lord says. I have healed this water. Never again, never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. And the water has remained pure to this day, according to the word Elisha had spoken. Let us pray. Father, again, we thank you so much for what we've already experienced in this worship experience. We thank you for where you're taking us in this word. Open our hearts and our minds. We may see you, see our purpose, see the vision clearly. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen. So last week we talked about Elijah being taken up in chapter 2 in a whirlwind. And you remember how Elisha was not ready to let him go. And, and the prophets in Bethel told Elisha, you know your, your master is going to be taken away today. And he says, be quiet. I already know. And then God sent Elijah to Jericho. And the prophets there went up to Elisha and said, you know that today your master's going to be taken away. He says, I know, stop talking about it, be quiet. And after Elijah was taken away, the Bible tells us that the prophets from Jericho watched by the Jordan River as Elisha came back in the same way, the same miracle that Elijah performed in order to part the Jordan River so that they may cross over was the same miracle that Elisha performed to cross back over the Jordan. It was at that moment that these 50 prophets said, clearly the spirit of Elijah is on this man. The mantle has been passed. He is the anointed prophet. Now, you remember what Elisha had prayed for? What did he pray for when Elijah asked him, what can I give you? What did he ask for? Give me a double portion of your spirit, a double portion. And what did we learn last week? That double portion wasn't simply about double the power. It was really more double the responsibility. And that's why Elijah said, it's a difficult thing that you're asking for, and I, I can't confer it on you. So if I leave and my cloak drops, then God has truly granted your request. Well, sure enough, the cloak dropped as he was taken up in a whirlwind. Elisha picked it up. He struck the water with it. It parted, and everyone knew the baton had been passed. Elisha is the man. Next man up. Next man up. And so he's ready. But the Bible tells us, as we continue on, it tells us that the people of the city of Jericho then went up to Elisha, saying that our town is well situated. We, we, we have water. <laughs> it doesn't make sense that we don't have a productive land. Now, for those of you who don't know the, the geographical setting here, this is where Sodom and Gomorrah and its cities used to reside. This is when Abraham and Lot in the book of Genesis decided to part ways. It said that Lot went towards Sodom and Gomorrah because it was a very lush and productive land. He was like, yeah, I, I, I want that green stuff over there. <laughs> Them palm trees? Yeah, I want to live in Glendale. I, I, I like that spot. That's where I want to be. And it was very productive and and. and even after Sodom and Gomorrah had been destroyed, the land was still productive. All the way up until you get to the book of Joshua, when Jericho had been overcome, things had changed. Joshua chapter 6, verse 26. Joshua 6, verse 26, it says, At, at that time Joshua pronounced this solemn oath, Cursed before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest, he will set up its gates. 
That's the curse that Joshua had pronounced upon those grounds, formerly known as the city of Jericho. And sure enough, in 1 Kings, in Ahab's time, the Bible says, this is in chapter 16 of 1 Kings. Let's go there. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 34 says, In Ahab's time, El of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his what? Firstborn son. Now, I think after that had happened, I would have been like, I think, I think the word of God is, is, is right on here. And, and I think what Joshua had pronounced is the real deal. L let me back up. No, after his firstborn son had died, the Bible tells us that he continues on and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. This was a cursed land, a cursed land. And so even though the city of Jericho still existed, it was still a very unproductive land based on the curse of Joshua that he had pronounced upon this area. Now, before Elijah is taken away, Elijah had ministered in this city. Do you think for a second that the people went up to Elijah and said, uh, prophet, our land is so unproductive. We, we, we need some help here. Prophet, can you do something about it? Do you think they gave him a request? We don't find it in Scripture, but what's the likelihood that the same people that went to the prophet Elisha, knowing that the mantle had been passed, that they, went, they had gone to Elijah previously and asked him to help out? How many think that's a logical deduction? Well, of course, Elijah never heard their request or he never did anything about it, right? It, it died at board meeting, right? It never made, it didn't get, a, it, didn't get it, it wasn't seconded. So the motion just died there on the floor, and so nothing had ever been done. But once Elisha became the prophet, once they knew that the power had been transferred over to him, the request, I believe, comes again. Help our unproductive land. And here is Elisha now, in the sandals of Elijah, so to speak, walking in his footsteps, uh, wanting to, to take it to the next level, next man up, going to the next level, and, and he wants a double portion of it, I would think that Elisha would say, I'm going to double down on what my teacher said before, on what my prophet, my father said before, and I'm going to tell you, absolutely not. Joshua said, this land is cursed, y'all know why it's cursed, and it ain't ever going to be blessed again. You see, because... <clears throat> If you want to be accepted by God, you should do the exact same thing that your forefathers did that were acceptable to God in the past, right? If you want to be blessed by God, I mean, give me that old time religion. Wasn't it good enough for Paul? Wasn't it good enough for Peter? Wasn't it good enough for Moses? I want to follow in the footsteps <clears throat> of my forefathers, I want to do exactly as the Word of God has proclaimed it. It is written in the Holy Scriptures. Elisha seemingly, watch this, goes against what is written. These new leaders, this generation, think they know what's best. Oh, when I was growing up. Who told Elisha this was okay? In fact, Elisha does some symbolic stuff here. He says, bring me a new bowl. There's a new sheriff in town. I don't want that dirty old bowl with your golden grams. Was in? No, I want, I want something new, a new bowl. A new vessel, because God is doing new things. Jesus Christ tells the listeners who were complaining because he wasn't baptizing and fasting the way that John the Baptist's disciples were fasting and praying and, and baptizing. And they said, you're just, you're a drunkard. You, you, you're, you're just a party animal. You're going from one place to another, just eating and drinking. You know, you're a glutton. And Jesus says, you, you can't take 
a patch of new uh, material and, 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 and take this and try to patch up old material with it because when it shrinks, it will tear the old and you can't take new wine and pour it into old wineskins. I'm going to say something to you that's going to mess with you a little bit, and I decided to bring back up. I decide to bring back up because I know the DNA of our church. I know the DNA of our denomination, and, and sometimes you can't say something if one of our matriarchs or patriarchs hadn't said it first. And so I'm just taking some backup. I'm not always going to use this backup because I would hope the Word of God is enough to convict hearts, but just for today, we're going to bring a lot of backup. Y'all want to do some reading? I call her Auntie Ellen. Some call her Sister White. Some call her E.G. Dub. She writes in the Review and Herald, September 13, 19, and 1898. She says, speaking about somebody who's into that old-time religion, good enough for my father, it's good enough for me. She says, this person reasons that my father kept Sunday and he was a good man and what was good enough for my father is good enough for me. For those of you who know, simply saying that he, he honored Sunday as the seventh day Sabbath. And he says, what was good enough for him is good enough for me. She says, but this is a mistake. We cannot be accepted in rendering to God the same service that our fathers rendered. We cannot be accepted in rendering to God the same service that our fathers rendered in order to be blessed of God as our fathers were, we must manifest that faithfulness, meaning the faithfulness of our forefathers. As they were faithful in their time, we should also be faithful in ours. And that devotion to God that will honor him before the world, we must acknowledge him as supreme. In order to reveal the truth, we must improve the light in our day as our fathers improve the light in their day. Improve? How can you improve on perfection? How can you improve on holiness? God's word is true. It is light. It is a lamp unto our feet. What do you mean improve on the light? Has anybody ever been in a situation where you had a light that was helping to guide your path and someone came along and brought a brighter light? Anybody? I got something better. And it's not as if the new light the brighter light cancels out the old light. It just helps you to see more, right? New light, improving on the light. Oh, you just had one quote, Pastor. That's all you have. Oh, ah, I told you I had backup. March 25, 1902. And just so you know, these are in uh, uh, Sister White's uh, uh, older years. She's not a youth anymore. She has a seasoned perspective at this time. She's been through life. She's been in ministry. She's seen the ups and downs, so her perspective is finely tuned. And she says in this article in March 25, she says, we have more light than they had in their day, and if we would be accepted of God, we must be as faithful in obeying the light and walking in as they were in receiving and obeying the light that God sent them. We must accept and what? Improve the light that shines upon our pathway as faithfully as they accepted and improved the light that fell upon their pathway in their generation. Wait, wait, wait. You mean there's generational light? Put a pin there because we're going to close on, out on, a, on, a, on another quote. Let's continue on. Review and Herald, September 13, 1898. These are, this, so this, just so you know, this is an article. This is like Twitter back in the day. I know it's X now. I can't call it X. It's just Twitter. So this is, this is what the Review and Herald was back in the day. People would just be writing articles. She would, she would sometimes respond to letters. And so people would read these tweets and be like, that's it. So she says, to the apostles and the prophets, and I like this because many of us might think, oh, she's just talking about ordinary people that just sit in the pews in a church. Uh, they need to keep on improving, but not the prophets, not the apostles. They've already came with full light, and there was no need for growth. They had it all. No, she says, to the apostles and prophets, Christ revealed himself and gave light for whose time? 
Whose time? Their time. For their time. Holy men of old walked with God. These men of faith lived the truth revealed to them for, here it comes again, their time. They improved their opportunities and privileges and returned their talents to God with an increase. They believed in the light, they walked in the light, and the light in them did not become darkness. You keep seeing that, that, this, 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 this word, improve, improve, improve. In other words, Joshua improved on the light that Moses had. Do you believe that? I shouldn't even ask you because your opinion actually doesn't matter at this point because Scripture tells us so. Moses had reached his ceiling, and God said, you cannot take my children into the promised land. And Moses said, why not? I've been doing it for 40 years. I've been leading your stiff-necked people. He says, you have reached your zenith, Moses. I'm now taking your servant, Joshua. He will finish the task. Is that fair to you? You think that's fair, that someone worked 40 years, built the church with their own hands, their sweat, the pews you're sitting on, they fabricated and put together, and here now you get to make decisions? And God says, it's absolutely fair, Moses. It is time to sleep. Joshua will take it from here. And Moses, he, 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 he fought God on it, right? He fought God on it. He said, Lord, come on now. I know I had a bad day. I had a bad moment. <laughs> don't judge me. Don't be, don't be so judgmental. He came to God three times, and God said, you ask me one more time, boy. I was like, all right, I'm out. Right? Moses had completed his task. He was good. Yes, pastor, that's the prophets and apostles of old, but today we have a light. It is the last day light for the last day message, the last day church, the remnant church, and you can't improve anymore. It, it, the light has stopped. Selected messages, volume one. Page 37. We have many lessons to learn and many, many to unlearn. God and heaven alone are infallible. Who's infallible? God and heaven alone. Those who think that they will never have to give up a cherished view, never have occasion to change an opinion, will be disappointed. She's just talking about all the little folks. She ain't talking about herself, right? She's not talking about her. She can't possibly be talking about herself people having to change their opinion, as long as we hold to our own ideas and opinions with determined persistency, we cannot have the unity for which Christ prayed. Sister White, you're for sure not talking about yourself. Whoa, she's not done. In regard to infallibility, I never claimed it. God alone is infallible. His word is true, and in him is no variableness or shadow of turning. She's answering someone who's complaining, saying that she made some mistakes. There were some historical things wrong in some of her writings. There were, there were numbers that were off. And she was like, yeah, get over it. I ain't perfect. And if you listen to her and read her writings from when she was a teenager, you read early writings all the way to some of these last articles and some of her greatest hits, Steps to Christ, Desire of Ages, towards the end of her life. I'm, even if you want to say, well, she was compiling a lot and she took some stuff and didn't give credit to it, whatever it is, I'm just telling you where she landed was different from where she begun. There is a trajectory, a development of thought, a deeper understanding of theology, and a deeper understanding of the character of God. She evolved like all of us evolve. If you listen to me preach when I was 15 years old in Redlands, California, at the Redlands Church, you wouldn't be able to match what I said then with what I'm saying now. I spoke as a 15-year-old who was just getting to know the Lord. And those times people put you up because they think it's cute that children start talking about God. They don't care so much what you're saying. It's just nice to put children up and say stuff. When I was preaching at 18 and 19 years old, I was still mimicking preachers. 
You should see my, 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 my sermon at PUC January of 1995 for the week of prayer. People came down for the appeal. People were crying. I am incapable of listening to that sermon. It's on my computer and I cannot listen to it. I am so humiliated and embarrassed watching myself walk around sounding crazy. But God was using that 18-year-old. And I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't preached that sermon. It was after that sermon that someone sent a video to, at the time, Jose Rojas, who was the youth director, and he invited me to speak at the World Church General Conference in Utrecht, Holland, and I preached there, and people started inviting me to preach at their churches, and that's how I ended up here. I didn't even want to be a pastor. I didn't even want to be a preacher. I was just asked to speak for a youth week of prayer kind of thing, right? I was just asked to speak for our student week of prayer at PUC. How did I get here? But God used what I knew and understood and what I could grasp at 18 years old and did the best he could with my uh, 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 unknowledgeable self. But what God did with that little in his hand, you know what he can produce, right? You know the Holy Spirit can make our foolishness of preaching make sense to folk, right? There are so many places where I say, I used to believe this way, I no longer do. And that doesn't make what I said in the past uninspired. It just means that inspiration was still filtering through a vessel that was not completed. And let me tell you, you give me enough time, give me another 10 years here, and you will still see more development. This is human nature. God has always worked with human beings. You know, even with prophets, they were not perfect. And we're going to find that out in this story. Listen, next Sabbath message is a scary message. I don't even want to preach it. I did my best to hide from it. And God is making me preach on Children's Day with this sermon. It's about bears and 42 kids. You know what's about to go down. He's saying, but you've got to talk about it. There's stuff in Scripture that can, uh, can be a challenge. I'm just simply letting you know that God is moving us somewhere. She says in Testimonies, Volume 3, page 64, she says, New fields are opening up in which all can test their calling by experimental effort. Excuse me? Experimental? That sounds like some kind of youth event. <laughs> and bringing souls out of, from darkness and error and establishing them upon the platform of eternal truth. Some of y'all don't even know this, but she was instituting praise teams back in the day. She said, it shouldn't just be one person singing. You should get a group together, and they should do their best to sing in harmony. She says, good music adds to the interest of the meetings. Yes, Auntie Ellen was endorsing praise teams. The point I'm simply trying to make that even in her day, it was radical. But what we have done is we have, we have, we have picked and chosen some of the most obscure quotes, all these things from men. She was 19 and 20, and we've made it our truth in which our church stands on, not realizing that God is continuing to develop his people. Who we were in 1960 is not what God expects us to be in 2024. And if that's where we are wanting to remain, going back to the good old days, 1960, pastor, this church was packed. God will say, bring me a new Joshua. Give me an Elisha. If you are unwilling to improve on the light and grow and develop, I will choose someone else who will listen to me. As I speak new light, I give new wine for this generation. Bring me a new bowl. Light becomes darkness, she says, to all those who will not walk in it in order to be accepted and pleased of God as our fathers were. We must, like them, be faithful. We must improve our light as the ancient, faithful prophets improved theirs. Isn't that beautiful? So Elisha asks for the new bowl, and he tells him to put salt in it. Now, you guys know what salt does to food, right? What does it do? 
It's several functions. What does it do? Especially for those that didn't have refrigerators back in the day. What did salt do? It preserves. What else can salt do? It can purify, it can cleanse, it can, it can clean things, right? What else can it do? Right? It adds savor to food. And so Elisha takes a new bowl with salt and has them poured into the water. Now let me ask you this question. Did Elisha need the salt in order to purify the water? Absolutely not. Did he need a new bowl? Absolutely not. What he was doing was using symbols to make a point. And it's a point that Jesus jumps on in Matthew chapter 5. He says, don't be worthless salt. (laughs) He says, you are the salt of the earth. Salt without savor is worthless. Salt was even used as money, as currency in Jesus' day. It was multifaceted. And and, and watch this, and watch this. Uh, Given the chemical properties of salt, it actually cannot lose its savor. It's impossible. So when Christ says salt that loses its savor is thrown out, it's impossible. But there was a flaky residue on the Dead Sea that looked like salt, but when you tasted it, it had no flavor. That was worthless. There are a lot of folk that look the part but aren't actually the part. There are people that look fruitful, but if you get close enough, you realize it's just the pretty plastic fruit you're not supposed to eat. It's just there to look pretty, but it has no purpose. Salt must come in contact with elements in order for it to fulfill its purpose. If salt is just sitting there, not touching anything, it can't change anything. It must touch the products. It must touch the food. It must touch the wounds. It has to be in contact with the elements. And this is why I tell you all the time, I'm going to keep saying it to you. People are like, you know what? We're, we're in the world, but we cannot be of the world. Absolutely right. But don't miss what Jesus says. You are in the world. When he says you're not of the world, he's simply saying we don't practice as the world does. We don't trip the way the world does. We are not petty like the world is. We're not unforgiving like the world is. We do not harbor bitterness like the world does. We are not hateful. We are not prejudiced. We do not, we do not discriminate based on people's socioeconomic status. We are of the kingdom of Christ. And that is why we are not of the world. But honey, we in the world. I need to say it again. We are in Hollywood. We are. And the only way we can change Hollywood is by touching Hollywood. Somebody say amen on that. We watched a part of the episode of The Chosen uh, uh, last night with our young adult ministry. Christina, our member who's one of the editors for that show, uh, she put it on and we're looking forward to when we can watch the season, uh, the, um, the, the film they have, the two first two episodes for the season four coming out. I know people that come to me and say, oh, The Chosen, you know, it doesn't really follow scripture. Do you know that it is bringing people to Jesus Christ? Their modern, fresh take on the Gospels and relationships within the Gospel, their modern take on the personalities of the disciples have made the Bible so relatable to people that they are coming to Christ. This is why we bring people in. We bring individuals who are in the world, and we take ourselves to the world. See, this is what I love about 2024, because because this is going to be a year where we touch Glendale. Because right now, they don't really know about us. They remember our thrift store, but they don't know us know us, right? We feel good about our worship. We get down. We, we, have the, we have the best music in town. We love this stuff. But it doesn't matter to the impoverished. It doesn't matter to the, to the broken relationships out there. They don't care, but we're going to find a way as we are electing new leaders to put it together a strategy so that we can do something in the city that is not being done, that we can add a service that is not being, that is not being given. We can serve the people in the way they have not been served. We're going to do something that makes this city better. Wait, watch this, watch this. God's will will be done on earth, here in the city, as it is in heaven. We are truly going to be salt. In other words, if this church were to disappear, Glendale would mourn. They would feel it. 
It would like, it'd be like losing a lamb. Wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. I, I heard they had to close their church down. What are we going to do? They're so good at. What do you think that's going to be? But they're the best when it comes to. What do you think that will be? Oh, I can't wait to fill in those blanks. We'll be doing new things. And I know some of you are going to challenge and you're going to say, but pastor, that's not the way we've done it in the past. And I get it. I get it. But here's the thing. I'm looking at my daughter's generation. Her generation doesn't want to show up at church. Because, pastor, it's the end times and we, we've heard this prophecy and it's a sifting. It's a shaking in the church. No, 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 no. There's no shaking going on in the church. We have failed to connect with this generation. Well, that's because they're on social media and the stuff that they watch. If they would only stop listening to music, there is something about what they're watching and listening that is more enjoyable than what we're doing here. But pastor, we're not supposed to entertain them. That, that's, that's, of the, that's of the enemy. Jesus believed that whatever he would be lifted up, that if he was the center, if he was the focus, that he would draw all. So Elisha says, your waters are healed. Never again will this land be unproductive. Never again. You're missing the point. This was the place of Sodom and Gomorrah. This was the place of Jericho. This was the place of so much apostasy where people were worshiping Asherah. This was a place that was so disgraceful in the history of Israel, not just with their enemies, but, but, but among their own people. And here's Elisha boldly saying, I know what Joshua said. I know that he cursed this ground, but God has appointed me to be here, and it is time for new things. Give me a new bowl, and give me salt, and let's make this church productive let's make this land fertile again we want to get to the point family where 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 we we have to actually seriously have conversations about having two services it can't happen pastor it can't happen yeah 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 if you believe that, then you don't believe the words of Jesus. I will build my church upon this rock and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. God is doing something big here, family. God is doing something big here. He is asking for new bowls and new vessels. No, don't worry, don't worry. We're not getting rid of the old as well. No, no, no. The old, the old is important. The old is a part of our foundation. The old is how we got to the new. Listen to, listen to what uh, she says here. And there's so many quotes. I had to skip some of them, but so good where she talks about the, throughout the ceaseless ages, throughout the infinite time, that we will always be growing, always ever learning. But just what she says in Christ's Object Lessons, page 127. She says, in every age there is a new development of truth, a message of God for the people of that generation. The old truths are what? Still essential. New truth is not independent of the old, but an unfolding of it. It is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. It is the light which shines in the fresh unfolding of the truth that glorifies the old. Who? He who rejects or neglects the new doesn't really possess the old. For him or her, it loses its vital power and becomes but a lifeless form. God is building something here. I've had people come up to me and tell me, oh, pastor, uh, uh, back in the day it used to be this way and it was so disappointing and I didn't want to come to church anymore and this pastor and that pastor and this person and this elder and this and this and this and that. Let me tell you something. We wouldn't be here without the pastors from yesteryear. This church wouldn't be where it is right now. I'm going to say something that's going to trigger some of y'all, and I'm going to say it anyways. We wouldn't be where we are right now without the leadership of Pastor Kyle, who was before me. I said it. I said it. 
There were things that he did, things that he instituted, things that bullets that he took that I will never have to take because he took them for me. When I looked at this church and I asked what's going on, I was told that you had a choir, but you also had a praise team. I said, check. That's not a battle. That means that we have, we have a generational church that's going to minister to the traditional and minister to the contemporary, the young, the old, black, white, everybody in between. I don't have to have that battle. Thank you, Pastor Kyle. I said it. We can go back to Pastor Kim, who was playing at the piano before the worship service, singing praise songs. We can go back to Truth and Spirit with Elizabeth Talbot and those leaders, right? Steve, you were a part of it as well. John, you were a part of it. Joel, you were a part of it. So there, there were things that started long ago. This is why we're here today. This didn't happen because I magically showed up. People put some blood, sweat, and tears for this church to be an intergenerational church, a multicultural church where new and old can exist and we can move forward. So I'm thankful for those pastors. I'm thankful for Pastor Smuts all the way back with Elizabeth Talbot when they decided that Grace Unconditional would be a big part of the makeup of this church. You, I read your, I read your tagline. I saw your website, Grace Unconditional. I said, check. I don't got to fight that fight. I am an outgrowth of Pastor Kyle. I'm an outgrowth of Pastor Terry, who was the interim pastor, who had to kind of settle the waters. I'm not here just, just because I, just, I, just, I, I magically appeared. I'm here because I did my research. I talked to people. I knew that Pastor Terry was a blessing here. And I said, hey, I would love it if we could continue to work together. Young, old, working together. All the cultures, all the colors, all of it, all of it. And God is doing something new. He has a new bowl. Are you going to be the salt? <laughs> One thing I love is that God can use those who were used in the past. He can still use them today. Are we going to do this together, family? Next. New. Now. Philippians 1.6 says this, I will finish the work that I have begun in you. Confident in this, never again. You're not going to go back. We don't need to go back. We need to go forward. But remember, the new is an unfolding of the old. So we're still rooted. That's, that's why I, I can unapologetically talk about Sister White. I'm not going to be afraid. I wouldn't be here had I not read her writings when I was younger. She was my crutch. I couldn't understand the King James Bible. She opened my eyes to stuff. I don't have to use her like I do now. I will some situations because, you know, some people don't believe unless she said it. But I wouldn't be where I was if she didn't unfold some of the characteristics of who God is. And then I went back to Scripture and said, there it is, there it is. It was always there. She simply said, high five, there you go. Here's the baton. You go with it. Pastor, you're saying something that's not, I, didn't, I, don't find, I don't find that another pastor said before. That's okay. It won't be the last time you hear something new. And after me, someone else will come with more light. Amen? But let's do our part in this moment, in 2024, what God has called us to do. Let's heal this unproductive land. Let's be salt. If you want that, say amen. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We are wanting to be transformed by you, Jesus. We are wanting to be conformed. We're ready for the new. We're ready for the next. We're ready for the now. You're building something. You're building something. And Father, I know, I know it hurts for some people to hear some of the tension from the past. It might be hard for us to reconcile some things, but, but we know in your word you are building something. Elijah didn't do what Elisha did because Elijah did what he was called to do, and Elisha's now doing what he's called to do. Next man up. Next, new, and now. 
So Father, some here right now that are being asked to do things that maybe their parents weren't asked to do in a way that hadn't been done before, experimental, if you will. And so, Father, we are going to take up our mantle. We're going to take up our cross. We're going to take the baton, and we're going to run with it because we want to bless Glendale. We want to bless Southern California. We want to bless people who are watching online. We want to help transform lives. We want to build your kingdom. We want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are ready. We are ready. We are ready. We have our bowl in hand. We have the salt. We're ready to pour it out. Never again will this land be unproductive. Never again will this church be unproductive. Never again will Glendale be unproductive. Thank you for this great commission. In Jesus' name, amen.